Hello and welcome to this Reddit AMA. I want to thank you and especially thank the moderators for this very generous invitation to speak to all of you who are interested in the academic study of the Bible. I'm thrilled to be able to come here and I want to thank everybody also for those who have supported me, who have supported me in the past, who have supported me now, and who will support me in the future. I'm making the big transition or trying to make the big transition. For those of you who know my story, I'm trying to become my own online entrepreneur. I'm trying to recreate, in a sense, how we deliver the product and service of biblical studies to human beings. And I'm testing those limits and I'm testing the online platforms and I'm putting my teaching online and I am trying my best, my very best to provide services to all of you. And so I hope that this is just one way that I can serve you and one way that if you haven't met me, that you get introduced to me and that we can begin communication. I want to say that I don't have time to answer every single question that was given. I was incredibly impressed by the depth of some of the questions. So what I can offer you and what I usually tell people is just meet me over on Patreon. You can join for free as a free trial member. You can message me there. You can send questions there. I try to funnel everyone there because if people are sending me questions, I'm on like seven different platforms. I, I just can't do it all. So I funnel everybody to the Patreon. So if you want to meet me there and, and repose your question, that would be wonderful. Okay. Interestingly, if I can begin with a little bit of a story, a lot of you asked how I am religiously, and I, I think there's a great curiosity about this. I'm writing a blog post on this. What I can say is that for me, scholarship is my spirituality. Scholarship is my spirituality. And stay tuned on the blog. I, I will say more about that, and I will say what I mean. I think, to also answer a very broad question that many of you raised, I think that the brick-and-mortar study of the Bible is dying, by which I mean the critical of secular study of the Bible. You know, when I worked for, and I, and I worked for now, four or five different academies, different institutions, and they all have that same story, and the same kind of moping attitude when they meet together in a room to discuss you know, business. And they're all complaining about lack of enrollments and they're all complaining about the administration shutting them down. And they all fear that because biblical studies and religious studies more generally, it doesn't make any money for the university. So they got no reason to house and fund the department. Okay, so, and that's true. You know, the average price of education in the States is $36,500. So friends, we're at a cusp, you know, we're at the cusp of a great revolution. People are realizing that they don't want to spend that on religious studies anyway. They don't want that. No one wants to spend almost $37,000 to get a religion degree, because what do you do with it, right? So I've been learning more and more that my audience are maybe like people like you, who who, who maybe never had the opportunity to take a, a real solid course, academically rigorous course in religious studies. You've been churched, maybe in your past, maybe no longer, but you're interested in religion, you're interested in the Bible, you're interested in inheriting the richness of a kind of Western spirituality. You're interested in seeing if there's anything in the Bible that can be resurrected or redeemed to help you in your spiritual journey. That's really what I'm here for. I'm here to provide Gnosis, to go deeper than your normal YouTube fare, okay? You know, the normal apologetics, then anti-apologetics, you know, the punch and then the counter punch. I'm here to give you exactly what I would give you in a brick and mortar classroom, the answers that I would give you. And in this platform, 
There's full freedom of speech. It's full freedom of speech. That's the glory of the internet. You can say what you want. It's also the bane of the internet. But in terms of what we're doing here, it is a wonderful thing. We can share and create a kind of community, a kind of virtual university, a, a virtual religion department in which we can talk about these sorts of things. And I can provide the services and opportunities for everyone who wants to go deeper. And so I encourage you again to look on Patreon, look at all the tiers, see what's for you, okay? This is the great secret. In 10 years, colleges and universities, hey, they might be folding. You know, if, you, if they don't have a big endowment, they might be folding because education is gonna transition online and I want to be there at the cusp of it. I want to be the vanguard. And I want to make a career out of this. And all of you are going to help me do that. I know you will. Okay, enough of that. Let me get to questions. So let's see. Again, amazing questions. Amazing questions. Thank you so much to everybody. I really appreciate it. I am going to start with, and I love the fact that all of you have secret names. Um, I'm going to start with Mormon, no, more mom. <laughs> um, and you mentioned Ian Mill's dissertation that he has a section arguing that Marcion's form of the Evangelion doesn't precede Luke. And I wanted your thoughts on this most convincing argument, which is about his most convincing argument about Vasilides. In short, he says that Vasilides lingered in Alexandria. That's true, according to, to Eusebius. You know, he, he lived there. And that was until about 135. And then Mill suggests that Vasilides dated Jesus' baptism to the 15th year of Tiberius, according to Clement. That's true. And, but here's the problem, that he quotes from the Lucan birth, and birth narrative according to the refutation. That's just not true. That's just not true. Mills is utterly wrong there. And I think this is very important, that the report on Vasilides and the refutation of all heresies does not probably go back to Vasilides, right? It does not probably go back to Vasilides. It seems to be a much more developed report that is about creation from nothing, and it's very high metaphysical theology. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful theological and philosophical reflection, but it probably does not go to Vasilides. So if someone is going to use this as, as evidence that Vasilides has the Lucan birth narratives, that's not going to work because this tradition about Vasilides, it's not attested in Clement, it's not attested in Justin, it's not attested in Irenaeus, it's only in the Refutator, and the Refutator is probably using an early third century document that is still Vasilidean. It still might be inspired by the thought of Vasilides, but Vasilides himself is long gone. Okay, so that's how that argument fails. And I encourage all of you to, to go check out The Refutation of All Heresies, awesome book, on my Patreon, there's a tier where I'll give you that entire 900 some page book. And I'll give you, I'll just send you the PDF of it. So check that out. It's an amazing deal. And on top of that, you can also download my book, We Are Being Transformed. That's almost like $200 on Amazon. And, and the refutation of all heresies is, is, I think, I don't know, I haven't checked recently, but I think that's also over $100. So that's a huge deal, folks. Let me go to the next question. Local Way 2459. My own opinion is that canonical Luke Acts can be the only main books in the New Testament that can be confidently put in the second century. I'm curious, what would you say is the single best evidence that all of them are second century? Okay, here's a shameless plug. I'm teaching a course right now. I'm redating the Gospels. Okay, you've all heard of it. I am now putting it on officially on my teaching platform, which is Fresh Learn. Okay, so you guys can sign up to Fresh Learn. I'll put the link in the description and get this course. Okay, but to answer this question, what is the single best evidence that all of them are second century? The manuscripts. The manuscripts. Okay, the fact that there are none. There are no first century manuscripts, there are no early second century manuscripts. And really, the manuscripts of these documents, I won't call it the New Testament because that's too vague. The New Testament really isn't invented until later, and it doesn't, that name doesn't hold until later. 
But these documents, these gospels, these epistles of Paul, these, these other epistles, forged or unforged, they're typically not witnessed in the manuscript tradition until the third and fourth century. The Bible that is that you have translated is really a fourth century product because that's when complete Bibles survive. All right, we simply don't have any manuscript evidence. Now, there are people, very conservative paleographers, who will tell you that they do have that manuscript evidence, but that, I believe, is untrue. And the only way that you can date one of these New Testament papyri is by doing paleography, that is, by looking at the handwriting. And I, I want to encourage all of you, all of you, go pick up Brett Nonbury's book, God's Library. It's going to teach you all about that. And everything that he has said, He's a wonderful papyrologist. Everything that he has said in terms of the dating shows that all of these early dates for the New Testament papyri, they are wrong and wrong-headed and based on wrong ideas about how you date a manuscript. And they're apologetically motivated. Nonbury doesn't say this. But it's very clear that a lot of these early dates are, are apologetically motivated because conservative evangelicals want to push those manuscripts back into the early 2nd century and the early and the, and the late first century, and that's just not true, folks. It's not true. Take my course, find out why, read Brent's book. It's there, the information is there. Ken Scaletta, how do you think Christianity got to Egypt? Okay, great question. And I'm not gonna punt on this, but I've actually answered this question in print in my new book, Early Christianity in Alexandria. So I am just going to send you there. Okay, look at chapters two and three. This book just came out about six months ago. Okay, I know it's expensive. I can try to get you a deal. Hop on Patreon. So look at those chapters. I tell you exactly what I think, how Christianity got to Alexandria. Locke Filotti, you've seen several non-academic sources that the Romans and Greeks especially did not truly believe in their polytheistic deities and mostly worshipped as a cultural signifier, much like how people identify with regional sports teams. Christianity as an actual evangelical religion was thus able to make headway because it wasn't actually competing with religions, but offering the actual religious experience. Classic apologetical argument. Garbage. Utter garbage. It's dismissive of other people's religions, it runs on the Christian exceptionalism assumptions, like, you know, or other people can't be authentically religious, or, you know, Christianity made headway because religion was just a cultural factor. No, the gods Isis and Osiris, the gods Zeus and Dionysus, these were real and true living gods. Don't let anyone try to convince you otherwise, okay? In fact, to many, they still are gods. So stop listening to that utter trash, okay? I'm, I, you know, I told you I was going to say what, what I think. It's utter trash, that idea. But the second part of your question is how did the actual Roman and Greek views on their own religion inform how people converted and practiced early, early forms of Christianity? Well, listen, people, <laughs> you know, Christians are always worried about syncretism, right? Syncretism, you know, when, when, you, when you go to like Caribbean forms of, of Christianity or, you know, when, when the, the conquistadors, you know, came into South America and, and spread Christianity and Catholic Christianity, you know, the people complain about it being, you know, syncretized. They, they say the same thing about, you know, when Christianity gets into Africa, that, that it's syncretized with native African tribal religions. Of course it is. But it was syncretized at the very beginning, Right, it was syncret. It was never. There was never a point where Christianity was not syncretized with other, with Greek and Roman religions. The minute that that whoever, whether it was Paul or some other unnamed missionary, who, when they came to Europe, when they set foot on Europe, Christianity was already syncretized. It's a syncretic religion, and that's its strength. It is the ability to absorb and assimilate, and then to transform and then to keep on going through history. A, a religion that doesn't evolve and transform and change will die. Christianity is living because it has this capacity. It 
took these Greco-Roman gods, these Greco-Roman conceptualities, and it trans transformed. You know, it, it took it took the Jewish, it took the Greek, it took the Roman, and it created something new from the very beginning. From the very beginning. All right, Exotic Sphere twenty eight. Which books do you think were the three last books written in the New Testament, and when do you think they were written? Could they be as late as the early third century? Yes, they could. The great example here is Second Peter. Second Peter isn't mentioned by anyone in the second century. And what's really odd is it isn't mentioned by Clement. Clement is living in Alexandria, and Alexandria has a strong Petrine focus. So Clement takes every opportunity to talk and refer to Peter traditions, but he never, ever, ever refers to Second Peter. If he could have, he would have. Okay, but he did, he does not know about it. He does not know about it. But Clement knows about pretty much every other book that you know makes it into the New Testament. So that's quite striking. So it's really not attested until the early third century. So probably it's right around two hundred. It's right around two hundred. So that would be my dating of it. So definitely, you can have a New Testament text that's that's late. And probably Jude, the epistle of Jude, is probably not that much earlier. They're connected. You know, Second Peter basically plagiarizes Jude. Joseon 1, Revelation 4, Ezra, and 2, Baruch were written around the same time and share similar themes like symbolic visions, the final judgment, a heavenly temple, and so on. But why did John of Patmos, Patmos feel he had the authority to pen such a vision of his own are in his own name. Well, let's not assume that John is his name, right? Let's imagine a world where John is already a pseudonym. And why would you use John? Why would a Christian writer use John, say, in the early second century? Well, it's to morph himself with apostolic tradition and, a, and an apostle or elder named John, right? That's already a present possibility. Remember, you know, at some point, these authors understand that if you're going to a gain, or if you're going to accrue authority for your book, that you need to appeal to apostolic authority. So you would use an apostolic name, and John was certainly a well-known apostolic name. I don't assume that that's the name, the real name of the author of Revelation. I think that could very possibly be a fictional name. And, you know, the ancients were fooled. You know, most ancients identify the author of John, the gospel, identify him with the apostle, and identify him also as the author of the book of Revelation. That's how he gets into the canon. That's a major, major assumption that allowed him to get into the canon. Still, still works today. All right, Metamodern Malakos. About the refutation of all heresies. You read the introduction. That's fantastic. You know, most people don't. <laughs> um, you know, you'll notice that I don't refer to this author as Hippolytus. You correctly point out that in the manuscripts, there's some evidence for originic authorship, that is, Origen being the author of book one, possibly in a marginal note uh, in book 10. That's all true. The problem is the author of the refutation clearly comes from Rome. Now, Origen had a, Origen had a sojourn in Rome, probably for several months, but he, he was not stationed there. So his, his biography doesn't fit the biography of the author of the refutation, okay? Whom I just call the refutator. He's, he's anonymous. He's a church leader. He has a definite church. He's in competition with an early third century uh, leader of Rome. If you want to call him bishop, that's fine. He, Callistus is his arch enemy, okay? And Callistus dies about 222, all right? So, yeah, if you really want to see the first takedown attack of the so-called popes, they weren't called popes back then, uh, but we get the most brutal attack in book nine of the refutation of all heresies. Make some popcorn, turn down the lights, read book nine of the refutation. It'll knock your socks off. Okay. Philosopher Zero, assuming parts of Acts predate canonical Acts, how likely, in your view, is the arrest of Paul in Jerusalem and the events surrounding it to be one of those older sections? Not likely. Sounds like fiction to me, doesn't it? I mean, the whole idea of Paul being a Roman citizen, that is utter fiction, in my opinion. 
And this whole episode seems to be constructed by the author of Luke Acts, or the editor, or however you want to call him, as fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus in the little apocalypse that um, people will, Christians will stand before kings and governors, okay? Let me tell you something. Paul was a nobody. He was a nobody to the Romans. He was a nobody to most people. If this hasn't sunk in, you know, let it sink in. I know that modern Christians, evangelicals, non-evangelicals, they still want to heroize Paul. I mean, you either hate him or you love him, but of, of the camp that loves him, they tend to want to heroize him. He wasn't a hero. He was never famous in his lifetime. He was almost certainly never a Roman citizen. And he never went to Rome as a prisoner. Okay? There's just no good evidence of that. He never spoke before governors and kings like some kind of sophist. That never happened. All right? That's a very, that's already, there's nothing there any more true than the portrait of Paul in any of the other apocryphal acts. Okay, the acts of Paul and Thecla. That Paul, that version of Paul is about as equally true, which is to say as about equally fictional as the Paul you get in Acts. Okay, the only reason why people try to dig out history from Acts is because it's in the canon. But just forget that for a moment. Forget the canonical framework because it doesn't exist in the second century. Okay. P-time, P-time, good to see you. Um, so you know that, yes, I'm trying to establish myself as an authority on Marcion. Absolutely. And there are other people who have done amazing work on it, including Jason Badoon and Matthias Klinghardt and Marcus Vincent, just three of the biggest names there. So what's my biggest... What's my unique contribution and disagreement between me and the other Marcion scholars? Okay, so I've written a blog post on Bilby specifically. So on my blog, search for Gospel of the Poor, okay? I've got actually five blog posts reviewing that book, okay? So I'm not going to talk about, about Bilby. I, I'll, t I'll say more in general, like in terms of comparing me with Marcus Vincent. Okay, Vincent is completely and utterly unique with his theory that Marcion himself wrote his gospel in the space of, a, and, and that all the other gospels are plagiarized versions of Marcion's gospels that appeared within the space of a five to 10 year window. Okay, I do not buy that. I do not buy that because there's not a single shred of evidence that Marcion ever said that he wrote a gospel. Marcion believed that the gospel was an inspired, authoritative work, and he did not feel like he could just correct it. He never said that he was inspired by the Spirit. He never considered himself to be apostolic. He was just a Christian who was putting together a canon that, were, that is a, a list of books that excluded other books, and he thought that his list of books had already gained authority that was already authoritative for him, and therefore that those books should not be changed, okay? So the whole idea of, of Marcion as a mutilator is completely wrong and wrong-headed, and I think also the idea of him as a gospel author is incorrect. He is a transcriber. I mean, he, he would make the same sorts of changes as any scribe would, but he's not, a, he's not an author or a compiler of a gospel. Okay, it doesn't originate with him in his school, okay? He doesn't have a school, he has a church, and that church has a Bible. In terms of how Marcion scholars reconstruct Marcion's canon, I think that one of the differences between me and others is that, say, for instance, Klinghart, Klinghart is willing to use manuscripts of canonical Luke to help us reconstruct the data in Marcion's gospel. And I don't think that that's safe. I think that we should just be depending on patristic attestations. And so we have about 15 patristic authors who tell us what was in Marcion's gospel. And I think that we should limit ourselves to that data and not try to fill in gaps with manuscript variants from canonical Luke, and that would include things like 
Papyrus 69 and Codex Visae. I think that those might be used as supporting evidence, supporting patristic citations, but they can't stand, they can't stand alone. Basically, what I'm trying to do is overthrow the Harnack paradigm, and the Harnack paradigm is that Marcion also was a Docetist and that he was a he was a diatheist. Now, I'm not sure if I mean I don't think Klinghardt or, or even Badoon really takes a position on those sorts of things, but I'm very distinctive in saying that Marcion was not a diatheist and he was not a Docetist, and he wasn't a detester of Jews either which you'll often hear among evangelical conservative scholars. For them, Marcion is a whipping boy and a foil. And I'm trying to get away from that. Okay, the next question is from the smart fool. Now, this is a particularly long and drawn out question. And I see that you're writing a piece and I appreciate you using my book, How the Gospels Became History. I actually have a tier on Patreon for any of those who are interested, and I will help edit your work. If you're trying to write an, an academic blog post or article or even a book, and, and you know that can be a fictional book as well, I don't mind that. I have editing experience. I work as an editor in my current job, and I would be happy to help edit your work and critique it as, as any academic would critique so that it survives peer review, okay? Now, I'm not going to answer every single part of this question, but I'm going to try to get to the heart of it. And you ask, why doesn't the beloved disciple show up more toward the beginning of the gospel, according to John? It becomes weird, you know, that the author doesn't place this disciple earlier because he's such an important authenticating device, right? He, he authenticates the crucifixion, and he authenticates you know, the solidity of, of Jesus' flesh, and he authenticates the, the tradition of the Gospel of John. So why not introduce him earlier? I think it's quite reasonable to suppose that the reason why this beloved disciple construct appears so late is because it actually occurred to the author or redactor of the Gospel of John late you know, it's really only in the last chapters of John that this character appears. And I know people then try to say that actually this character is referred to by name earlier. Maybe he's Nathaniel or something. I think that's kind of post hoc reasoning to basically deal with an anomaly. And the anomaly is this character is late. He's not well introduced. And we don't know where he's from. And, you know... That's, that is weird. That is weird. And I, I think that, you know, there's no reason that in other editions of the Gospel of John, this character couldn't be introduced earlier. I just think that when the Gospel of John was fixed as a tradition, that a, a, a serious systematic revision was no longer possible. And so they were stuck with this late narrative device. Okay. And I, and I do think, yeah, basically... You know, the, the author or the, or the editors of John came up or invented the idea of the beloved disciple as a self-authenticating device, but they came up with it late, and that's why that he appears late in the narrative. Okay, Owen Huckleberry, 1294, you are especially intrigued by Carpocrates and the constellation of early Christianities. Fantastic. I would like to know what percentage of all Christians were proto-Orthodox at the beginning of the second century, and what percentage changed at the end of the second century? Okay, so the quick answer to this is none. No one in the second century identified as proto-Orthodox, and no one in the second century identified as heretical either. All of these are anachronistic labels. In fact, I think Bart Ehrman invented the name proto-Orthodox, which is really not a great name because it's, it's, it's anachronistic. It's sort of like me saying that, you know, someone in uh, 12th century Europe is a proto-Methodist. Um, I mean, they didn't know what, what Methodism was or what it would be. So, like in the second century, likewise, they don't know what, what orthodoxy would be or would end up, you know, they, they had no idea. So I, I prefer not to call them proto-orthodox. I'm open to suggestions for other names. I tend to use early Catholics. I understand what you're saying, though. You, you, you want to count heads, and I wish we could do that. 
What I would advise you to do is similar to how I advised earlier. I've got a discussion of this in the very last chapter of my Alexandria book. And so I'm going to point you there. And what I encourage you to do is go read that and then come back at me with another question. Because there I'm going to tell you, you know, how we can think about majorities and minorities and about numbers and about demographics. And so that's the, the, best I can, the best I can do because I've already answered this in print. Rare cartographer 827, are the gospels influenced by Greco-Roman paganism? And if so, how? Easy question. Please go read, go pick up Jesus Deus and especially how the gospels became history. How the Gospels Became History is now on Audible. It's a good read. Uh, what I would really love for you to do is go see my answers there because I talk about how we can, how we can conceptualize influence, right? And I talk about the method of how that came to be, and I use this term dynamic cultural interaction. Go read those materials and come back at me with a more specific and concrete question. I am glad to answer this, but I wanna do so in a very concrete way. So if you haven't checked out those texts, please do. Lost in Earth, do you think the writers of the New Testament and early Proto-Orthodox Christians would have denied the existence of Zeus, Isis, and the other gods and goddesses, or would they consider them real entities? Definitely real entities and definitely demonic, right? Platonic philosophers also speculated about daimones who masqueraded as gods, that is, these middle management divine figures who pretended to be more powerful than they were in order to get more sacrifices, basically, and more power over a local area. So that's sort of how Christians came to conceive of their of competing gods. They're, they're daimones pretending to be something more powerful. And it's all about demonic deceit and about this world being a tyranny and the government being corrupt. Okay, that's how they that's how they think of that. Goes back to Paul, but it's in fact earlier than Paul. It's a very common Jewish, Jewish interpretation of Greco-Roman religion. Okay. Baron von Crunch, if you could impress one understanding or finding from biblical scholarship on Christians, what would it be? And if you could impress one understanding or finding from biblical scholarship on non-Christians, what would that be? Well, I think it would be this. It, it is that the Bible doesn't say anything. You know, the Bible doesn't have a mouth, right? We're the ones that have mouths, brains and mouths, right? Now we're reading the text, and, but it's often the interpretive community or the hermeneutical community that, that shapes what the text says. So if you've been helped or if you've been hurt by the Bible, I think you can thank your hermeneutical community. Some of us are burned out fundamentalists, right? Some of us got hurt, not by the Bible so much, but by the church interpreting the Bible, but by the particular denomination that you came out of. And, you know, that's not necessarily the Bible's fault. And, you know, you have every right to escape those oppressive hermeneutical communities. But you also have the ability, I think, to then take the next step in you know, your journey as a human being and as a spiritual human being and to see if the Bible can still be a resource for your spiritual walk of life or your you know, journey and growth intellectually, morally, spiritually by coming into or joining a, a new hermeneutical community, and that would be like this Reddit community. I don't really know anything about Reddit, but I, but I suspect that you who contribute here, basically you, you form an, an intellectual community, right? And you study the Bible in a new way, and, and you essentially shape the Bible to do other things for you, right? And, you know, probably some texts in the Bible are really unredeemable, but, but other texts, you know, in, in, in the exploration of what they mean, they do still redeem us. You know, I, I still believe in the saying of the Gospel of Thomas that, you know, 
The one who seeks the interpretation of these sayings in the seeking is the salvation. In the seeking is the salvation. That's why I say to me that that's why I say to you that scholarship is my spirituality. I don't divorce those two. Those are not different in my in my head. And, it, and that can be the same for you as well. Let's see, for Chan Anon user. <laughs> I think I said that right. Um, I am familiar with these other, you know, critiques of Bauer, okay, Walter Bauer's Orthodoxy and Heresy. And here again, <laughs> Sorry if this is annoying, but I have talked all about this in print already in my introduction to the Alexandria book. I, I take you through what Walter Bauer said, and I take you through what people said against it, and I take you through what I think, okay? Personally, to give you the short answer, no one of Bauer's critics, who were typically evangelical and conservative or traditional, no one actually measures up to Bauer himself. Bauer is an absolute master of the material and a genius. Perhaps we can apply what is sometimes applied, what is sometimes said about Marcion, that no one understood church history except Bauer, but he didn't understand it. And the reason why he didn't understand it is because he's working with an orthodoxy versus heresy paradigm, which is simply anachronistic, right? We, we no longer work with this paradigm, right? You know, I, I mean, because it's it's based really on fourth century conceptualities. Again, no one in the second century identifies as orthodox or heretical. No one even has, no one even would know what those would mean, you know. And they certainly wouldn't mean what we think that they mean, right? They're all anachronistic categories. So it's best to just throw them away and, and just look at the pure diversity of all of these of all of these people. And this is what I tried to do in my book, Found Christianities, which, unlike some of my books, is actually affordable. I, you know, just a, a word to the wise here. The reason why the Alexandria book is a little bit pricey is because it's new. OK, you've got to wait for the paperback. And that's fine if you want to wait for the paperback. Totally fine. Uh, I, I might try to get it on Audible. That takes some additional work on my part. But, you know, if you support me, you know, the more support I get, the more time I have, the more time I have, the more I can try to make these books affordable by putting them on, on different sorts of platforms. So keep that in mind. All right. Man of the Wild. When and how did the Israeli Judean deity Yahweh become the just generic God of what would become Christianity. Well, the truth is, for some Christians, that never happened, right? So to some, like Marcion, he never assumed that the local Judean daimon was a universal deity, okay? And I would say, you know, despite, again, current Orthodox understandings, actually, probably a lot of Gentiles in the early period, late first, early second century, wouldn't have made the assumption that the Yahweh speaking or the Lord, to use the reverential name, the Lord speaking in the Septuagint, which is the Greek edition of the Hebrew scriptures, they wouldn't assume that he was a universal God either, right? I mean, he does claim he's the only God, but they still wouldn't assume that, right? Because he hadn't yet attained the status of a philosophical deity. He hadn't become the Platonic good, right? That would develop very slowly as, you know, elite Christian authors began to use the resources of, of Platonic philosophy. And that's really a story that happens mostly between the, the late second and fourth century and beyond, where the Hebrew deity is, is fully, fully Platonized. You know, Platonic philosophy and, and Hebrew theology kind of struggled, you know, but eventually, I mean, as we can see in the Nicene Creed, Platonic philosophy definitely won in the fourth century, the fourth century, okay. But now, you know, the, you know, now we have Hebrew Bible scholars that tell us otherwise. And, you know, people make whole careers and exciting YouTube episodes that are all based on the theme that, you know, actually the, the native Hebrew or Semitic conception was very different than the Platonic philosophical conception and we should prefer the Hebrew conception or, or the ancient Near East conception or, or whatever. So that's fine too. Um, you know, that you, you can go that route. 
Um, but again, it's it's just a matter of you know what your what you and 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 what your culture find to be plausible. I think in order for Christianity to become the imperial religion and the force that it did in the fourth century, you know, it had to claim universality, and so it used the tools of philosophy in order to make that in order to make this very local Hebrew deity into a, a universal deity. And yeah, that's a story of, I would say, mostly third and fourth century, and they really only pull that off in the fourth century. So I got to tell you, I am exhausted. I worked all day today and, uh, you know, doing my, my normal day job, and now I'm, I'm trying to do this um, in the early evening here, um, skipping dinner. <laughs> um, and, and, but, but I, I, I want to say that to me, this is a labor of love. You know, I'm, I'm starving, I'm hungry, I'm tired. I, I'm, I'm on, I'm still on my feet. Uh, but I absolutely love this and I'm passionate and I love the fact that I can answer your questions directly. Again, I apologize to anyone, you know, I, I can't, get to everybody's questions, and I, I can't sometimes get to the complexity of, of everyone's questions. But what I want to invite everyone to do here, if you get anything out of this episode at all, and I, I hope that I've shown you, you know, the first fruits, and this is only the first fruits, start a relationship with me, right? Go on Patreon, find out what services you can get, find out what I can give you, and you can tell me directly, you know, I love it when people say, you know, Dr. Lipwood, please have a course on this. I'll definitely buy this course, you know. And I've got, you know, I, I've got so many ways and I've got so many thoughts now and so many platforms now where I'm trying to serve people like you. I've got the blog. I've got something called Gnostic Archive, which is a book review and article, scholarly article, summary service. That's also on my website. I've got the courses. I've got about six courses, which I hope all of you will check out. I've got Patreon, you know, a dozen tiers where you can find the services that will meet your needs, okay? And, you know, so, so join this journey with me. I think that I'm sufficiently distinctive enough for you to say, you know, let me give this Litwa a try, right? <laughs> um, let me experiment with him and go on a journey with him. And I hope that in many ways our stories will converge and in many ways you will be able to invest in yourself by accessing all the tools and resources that I am happy to give you. This is only the beginning, folks, not the end. Let's go on this journey together.